Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum once again. I hope you are tired. Not tired, so I ad admire your strength and patience. And uh, this uh, session that we are going to start on maritime, I thought it's going to be very uh, short session because both Pakistan and Egypt are developing their maritime sector. And I'm really thrilled, maritime sector, not... So, uh, but I'm thrilled that there are going to be 12 speakers. So you have to brace up. And since there are only seven seats here, we are going to split this session into two uh, sub-sessions. And uh, I hope uh, the speakers will do some favor to you by making their speeches as concise and as brief as possible so that we can have more interactive discussion. So with this, I'll first invite our first speaker, uh, His Excellency Rear Admiral Radha Ahmed Ismail. He is first under secretary of the Ministry of Transportation from Arab Republic of Egypt. Sir. Uh, our second uh, speaker is Mr. Zahul Ahmed Guledi. He is information minister from government of Balochistan of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, sir. Our third speaker is my colleague, Rear Admiral Javed Iqbal. He is uh, presently Naval Secretary from Naval Headquarters, Pakistan Navy. Our fourth speaker is Al Sayyid Al Fateh Sharkawi. He is uh, General Manager of Maritime Transport, Economics, Planning, Research and Studies Department, Swiss Canal Authority, Egypt. Our sixth speaker is Mr. Khurram Aziz Khan. He is Chief Executive Officer of Pakistan International Container Terminal, which is located in Karachi Port. Is he here? And our seventh speaker is going to be Mr. Amir Aziz. He is head of the commercial uh, department of Karachi International Container Terminal. Both container terminals are in Karachi port. Is he here? So we have got only four speakers in this session. Maybe I invite somebody from the second session so that we have got six and six. Uh, engineer Tamir Hamad, he is uh, head of technical office management department, Swiss Canal Authority. Thank you, sir. So without uh, saying much, I think uh, I should keep my remarks very, very brief, and I'll invite uh, Rear Admiral Raza to come over and uh, enrich us with his views, please, sir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Excellences, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of His Excellency Dr. Hisham Arafat, the Minister of uh, Transport, I have the honor to welcome you all. I would like to convoy his uh, sincerely uh, apologize for not attending this important event today due, due to the other work committees. However, he uh, assures the depths of the Egyptian-Pakistan relations. In fact, Egypt was the first country in the Middle East where an embassy for the Islamic Republic of Pakistan was opened directly after gaining independence. Today marks 70 years since the birth of the Egyptian-Pakistan relations, which proves the significance of the partnership between the both countries uh, on the bitral level. These long years of cooperation 
affects the strong desire of both countries, government, and people to enhance their relation, relations as well as levels. It's worth mentioning that due to the economic importance of the partnership between the countries, especially in the maritime field, uh, uh, a MOU of merchant shipping was signed in and established in 2013 between the Egyptian Ministry of Transport and the Pakistani Ministry of Ports and Shipping. Egypt recognized the importance of the main role that the Islamic Republic of uh, Pakistan plays in the Built and Road Initiative, as well as the role of Gwidar Ports as an important hub. Thus, we are keen to enhance cooperation and integration between the key players of the Chinese initiative to achieve success and benefits at all levels, which is the aim to, of today discussed during the event. The Egyptian Ministry of Transport is, uh, the Ministry of Transport is looking forward to achieve maritime cooperation and logistic integration between the two countries ports located on the Skid Road. We are also looking forward to establish a strong partnership between both countries in future, especially within the One Road, One Build initiative, and to consider establishing a maritime corridor between Egypt and Pakistan, passing the Swiss Canal up to the Mediterranean. The, this corridor aims achieving effective partnership between Gwadar Seaport and the Egyptian ports located on the one road, one build special for Red Sea ports, which will have its impact on enhancing the rule of the two countries in the build and road initiative and increasing the benefits they could gain but this ambitious initiative. Finally, I would like to thank you, the organization of this conference for their great efforts, wishing them all best and great success. Thank you. Uh, Rear Admiral was on the dot. Thank you very much, sir. You said concise things in a very effective manner. Uh, now I invite uh, Mr. Zahur Ahmad Buledi, the Minister for Information. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. It is a great privilege for me to be here, and I am personally thankful to Sasi who has provided me this opportunity. It gives me a great pleasure to be speaking at an audience with regards to the emerging developments in the geoeconomic landscape underway in Pakistan, as Gawadar stand poised to be linked to the global maritime trade connections. The new vistas and avenues of development in the light of CPEC BRI trade initiative have opened up region as the regions comes together to build partnerships. In this regard, the relationship of Egypt and Pakistan as the leaders of the new economic order is significant. Both the countries rich in human resources, minerals and trade routes stand to benefit from the developing economic landscape. Before I proceed with the keynote address, it would not be right to not mention the tireless efforts of the South Asian Strategic Stability Institute University and the Embassy of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan in Cairo. Under the auspices of Ministry of Trade and Industry, Arab Republic of Egypt for organizing such an elaborate and intricate platform for discussing economic development and trade transformation and the regional connectivity. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is rapidly transforming and at the center of this transformation is economic development. 
is none other than Pakistan and Egypt. It also must be noted that no economic transformation is complete without the utilization of and expansion of robust energy infrastructure and access to these for future energy security needs of the states. Fossil fuel are the, our biggest source of energy generation. Over 65% of the world's current energy production is from steam generators using fossil fuel. Out of this, 40% of, of the fossil fuel generation is from oil and gas. It would be an understand, understatement to say that fossil fuels are an important component of economic development. It is, in fact, the backbone of the future economic development. Future economic development of countries will be dependent on, the, on their ability to harness and exploit their economic infrastructure. Ladies and gentlemen, with regard to the Indian Ocean region is home to a wealthy wealth of natural resources and the domain of oil and gas. Three quarters of the world oil reserves are in the Indian Ocean. 17% of the global natural gas reserves are to be found in the Indian Ocean region. Not only this, the Indian Ocean region has become a conduit for the transportation of global oil and gas. Three of the most important trade choke points are present in the Indian Ocean region. Approximately 17 million barrels of oil are transported through the state of Hormuz alone. And 11% of the world seaborne petroleum passes through the Gulf of Aden. Approximately 3.9 million barrels per day of crude oil passes through the Swiss Canal in 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, considering the importance of the Indian Ocean region, one cannot help but appreciate the strategic position of the Gawadar port and the Swiss Canal in the dynamics of the global maritime oil routes. The Swiss Canal and Gawadar are at the hub of maritime oil routes. Through the utilization and development of infrastructure, these hubs can become the center of the global economic development of the future. The emergence of CPEC on Pakistan economic horizon is a welcome development as it is a trade enabler. Pakistan has undertaken extensive development of the Gawadar port to enhance the potential of the port and to maximize the geographical potential that the port has. Similarly, the Swiss Canal has also undertaken massive infrastructural development since its inception. And the recent one is nothing short than of an engineering marvel. The result is that it has allowed the increase of trading hub through which the trade potential of canal has also increased. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude my address by pointing out future development prospects between Egypt and Pakistan is the signature of the future as both countries share our destiny. Not only are Pakistan and Egypt occupying a strategic position in the international shipping of oil, but they also are blessed with an abundance of natural resources. Human talent and leadership, all what is needed for the future harnessing this potential. In fact, there has been recent exploration in Pakistan, which have entered at oil reserves in the region of Pakistan bordering Iran. And so is the case, I believe, in Egypt. For Pakistan, it has been speculated that these oil reserves can rival that of Kuwait. Similarly, there have been discovery of oil wells in the western desert of Egypt as well. These developments indicate that Egypt and Pakistan have massive potential when it comes to oil exploration and drilling of, new, of the near future. Also, the development of the BRI CPEC initiative will help further bolster the economic infrastructure of the region. As a result, this we can together have a great impact on the economic development of the region. When it comes to the utilization of natural resources, with these few words, I believe that the oil and gas industry of the two states will have some great news to share soon with the rest of the world. I would once again like to thank the organizers and Dr. Mario Sultan for such a brilliant initiative. And I thank the esteemed audience for their patience and attendance. 
long live Pakistan Egypt friendship. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Now I will invite uh, Rear Admiral Javed Iqbal to, from Naval Headquarters to give his views on maritime development. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Distinguished guests, excellent hosts, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum, good afternoon, and Alan Wasalan. Like Admiral Hosseini said, that keep the talk short. And uh, since I am a military officer, they say that they, there are two rules in the military. The boss is always right. And uh, if uh, you have any doubts, see rule number one. So I intend fully complying that. I'll be skipping through most of the slides and uh, sharing with you the central thoughts and ideas of my presentation. Uh, notwithstanding the strategic overtones of the CPEC, or, and, or the Gawadar port, it is and it remains and it will remain a purely commercial venture. Uh, and there is no military dimension uh, associated to it. Now, uh, this would make you wonder what a serving naval officer is to do in a gathering of uh, tradesmen and uh, people pursuing uh, trade opportunities. Well, uh, this thought occurred to me and it reminded me of a movie, Crimson Tide, of 1995 origin, in which there is a mutiny on a U.S. nuclear submarine, and uh, there is commanding officer and the executive officer are having a dialogue about the interpretation of a signal which uh, supposedly is supposed to authorize a la nuclear launch. And the, since the executive officer has more uh, supporters, he says to the commanding officer that, you, you know, sir, this signal interprets that we are not to make a nuclear launch. And then the, uh, the, uh, the Gene Hackman, who is the commanding officer, says that uh, legendary dialogue. He says, son, we are here to preserve the democracy, not to practice it. So I am being a serving naval officer. I am here to preserve the CPAC and not to practice the commerce. Now this brings me to the key postulate of my talk, that how will the CPEC uh, influence the maritime security and what Pakistan is going to do about it. Uh, CPEC and Swiss uh, ha have many similarities and the one as a military officer which critically uh, strikes me is of a juggler vein. And with juggler vein goes the notion of the core national interest and that is what is going to be its importance for the military. Uh, here on this slide you can see the, uh, the please come to the next one. The, the pattern of the slogs, the sea lines of communications, uh, you know, next one, which are being draw, driven uh, by the trade between east and west and which are funneled, yes, this one, which are funneled at one end uh, through Previous, please. Previous slide. Slots. Yes, keep it here. So, as they say, there are no roads on the seas, but uh, don't take them uh, for right. There are roads, and the roads or the highways or the sea lines of communication emerge because of the peculiar routes that the ships adopt. So, as you can see, like Swiss integrated the west and the east and brought them closer. Uh, the 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 maritime sea lines of communications, there is going to be a phenomenal change and uh, the, the, the slogs are going to emerge from Gawadar and connecting Gawadar with the Swiss route. And that is where uh, the importance of the navies come in to keep the maritime domain secure and to guarantee a safe conduct of the maritime commerce. Uh, there may be many calculations, but it has been said that the total external trade of China at present is about $3.5 trillion. And if only uh, 7 to 8 or maximum up to 10 percent is diverted through this uh, CPEC route, then it means we are talking about a maritime commerce of $350 billion per year through Gawadar and the, the sea lines of communication emanating and terminating at Gawadar. And as it becomes fully operational, it will be also a natural choice for a transshipment port for uh, Central Asia and Afghanistan. 
Hence, the shipping activity in our waters is going to be uh, extremely high and uh, f will experience exponential growth. This naturally places uh, additional responsibility on the Pakistan Navy to ensure the comprehensive maritime security and keep the Gawadar port and the entire regional maritime domain secure. Uh, now I'll come to the challenges, and the challenges can be broadly divided into traditional and non-traditional challenges. Uh, one of the key factors is the over-securitization of the Indian Ocean region because of the interests of the major powers, because uh, you know, the Indian Ocean is the most talked about uh, ocean because of the proximity to the energy sources, this, there are security challenges, interests of the major powers. And then there are a host of factors, uh, especially concerning this region. And they, these can be enumerated as a challenging U.S.-Iran relationship, the Sino-U.S. competition for enhanced influence, the Indo-U.S. naval bonhomme and the quote-unquote, the U.S. desire to make India as a net security provider in the Indian Ocean region, the core dispute of Kashmir between India and Pakistan, which has the potential of uh, you know, becoming a flashpoint in the region. And another grave dimension is the nuclearization of the Indian Ocean by India, which seeks to disturb the strategic stability. Now, th there is a protected conflict in Afghanistan, and you know the maritime domain cannot be divorced from whatever is happening on, on the land. And the naval forces of Pakistan, as well as the coalition forces, have been operating in this area to keep the maritime domain secure. Uh, and then we have the uh, conflict of Yemen, uh, which is going on. Uh, it is critically impacting the maritime security, and we have seen a number of attacks, signature attacks on the maritime uh, merchant ships. You can take these attacks as isolated uh, attacks and incidents of the maritime terrorism. However, I'm of the view that the world may be on the cusp of witnessing the unfolding of a classical maritime hybrid warfare. And this is an altogether a new dimension, you know, and which needs detailed analysis. In the non-traditional domain, you know, there are many threats like piracy, narco arms, and human smuggling. And I'll quickly flash the piracy slide. You know, the piracy was the major threat in this region, and it took, uh, you know, the, the navies of the world to uh, defeat this threat. But uh, the pirates may be down, but they are not out. And unless the, the, the geographical conditions remain unchanged, this can resurge again. And similarly, the narco and arms smuggling uh, remains a persistent challenge in this area because of many factors, and I will not go into the detail of it. Ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan and, and the Pakistan uh, Navy remains ideally placed to address these challenges because of the proximity, because of the coastline that we have. I'll quickly flash a number of uh, initiatives that we have been doing. Pakistan Navy has been part of two combined uh, multinational task forces, uh, 150 uh, for maritime security operations and task force 151 to counter the piracy. Uh, in summary, we have been deploying ships for over uh, more than a decade. 100 ships in rotation have been deployed for two to three month cycle. A number of boarding operations have been uh, conducted, you know, seven tons of hashish, two tons of cannabis resin. Uh, entire 30 percent of our entire fleet uh, has remained deployed here. But recently, Pakistan Navy uh, has instituted a regional maritime security patrol and uh, on the three axes in the Indian Ocean, as shown. Uh, there is a joint maritime information and coordination center to share the information of white shipping. And uh, there is another initiative that Pakistan Navy has been doing, which is the Aman Multinational Exercise. And uh, a number of countries have been participating in it. And the purpose of that exercise is to join hands and defeat all these threats and challenges. Uh, I'll conclude because I'm getting a reminder because we are overall running late. Uh, I'll specifically uh, cover the two challenges. One is the coastal security and harbor defense. Uh, Pakistan Navy has invested a lot. Overall, as a, as a country, Pakistan has invested a lot to ensure, uh, to set up this organizational structure.
to ensure that the maritime domain remains safe. And there is a dedicated task force 88 for that purpose. And to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I would say that you know, the, because of the nature of these transnational maritime threats, no nation can do it alone. And that's the purpose of our sitting here. And uh, I invite the Egyptian armed forces, in particular the Egyptian Navy and the organizations which have to do with the maritime domain to join hands and uh, we can ensure security for CPAC, for maritime security of CPAC, for everyone to harness. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Javed. Uh, now I invite Mr. Al Sayed Al Fateh Sharkawi. He is uh, General Manager of Maritime Transport, Economics, Planning, Research Studies Department, Swiss Canal Authority. Give him a good applause, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. It's a good opportunity for me to share in this good event, and uh, I thank us or organizers of this event. I heard the many speakers are recommending it for cooperation between Pakistani and ports and the Suez Canal. It's a good recommendation, really. And what I want to confirm now, in the beginning of my presentation, that we are ready in Suez Canal to cooperate and we are ready to, we are ready to, to accommodate all the types of the cargo and all the quantities of the cargo and all the sizes of the ships that can come from Pakistan or from all the Asian countries. Even going to Europe, going to Asia, I mean going to United States of America, all the continents on the east and the west were ready to accommodate all this cargo. And I, I'll tell you in brief how we are ready in Suez Canal. As you know, Suez Canal has a strategic global location. Then Pakistanian cargo can reach all these uh, regions in the north and the, in, in the west. Suez Canal has many advantages. Suez Canal is the shortest route between east and the west. Suez Canal is accessible, no locks. Suez Canal is available to be widened and deepened in any time. Suez Canal is very safe and very secure. Suez Canal now can accommodate the biggest ship, container ship, now is ready. Even the future generations from now, Suez Canal is ready. Our share of the global seaborne trade is about 8% of all the types of cargo. From container cargo, cargo, our share is about 25%. Our share of maritime container cargoes between Asia and Europe is 100%. Suez Canal is achieving a, a savings for the different types of ships. Of course, the savings is different from depending on the port of origin and the port of destination. I'll try to shorten my presentation as, as possible. Suez Canal is the longest artificial navigation channel in the world. The length of the canal is about 193 kilometers. The depth of the canal about 66 feet. The double the parts in the canal is about 111 kilometers. So this canal can accommodate 
hundred percent, as I said to you, of the all the container fleet in the world can accommodate ninety three of the bulk fleet can accommodate about sixty three of the tanker fleet and they can accommodate hundred percent of all other of the ships. We are ready also in Suez Canal to be flexible. We have our flexible marketing policies. Always we are watching the maritime transport market and taking the suitable decision in the suitable time to keep our customers and attract more customers. Also to attract the Pakistani cargoes and the Chinese cargoes coming from the Pakistani ports like Gawadar. Of course, this is map for the one belt, one route. And of course, the Pakistani ports, I expect them especially Gwadar port to have a very important role to transport the Chinese cargo to the Indian Oceans, then to come to Suez Canal. This is the map and the route between Gwadar port and Suez Canal going to Europe, going to Americas and everywhere. This is a map about the development of Gawadar port in Pakistan. As you can see, the distance between west of China to Gawadar port is very short compared with the distance between the west of China to Shanghai. Then the west of China area, it is better for this cargo to come through Gawadar port than coming to Suez Canal to Europe and the uh, different. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we understand that the speakers cannot give their full thought, and that is a handicap. But I think in the question answer sessions, we can compensate for that. Now I uh, invite the last speaker, Engineer Tamir Hamad. He is also from Swiss. Uh, Canal Authority to tell us about his views. Thank you. Uh, alaikum, uh, good afternoon, and we thank uh, Dr. Maria for the kind invitation to attend this valuable conference. My name is Tamir Hamad. I am from South Canal Authority, and uh, many of my colleagues talked about a new canal and South Canal and the South Canal Economic Zone. And allow me in the coming minutes to talk to you about the South Canal and New South Canal from operation point of view. And in the last three slides, I'll talk to you about the SC zone and how Egypt looked to this area as the future of Egypt, inshallah. But uh, in the front of you, this is our South Canal new logo after opening the new canal. We have doubling the waterway, so we make two uh, opposite uh, vessels uh, mentioned to the uh, having two canals, not only one canal. And as my colleague, Mr. Said, talk about the South Canal, it's one of the most important maritime navigation routes in the world. Of course, it saves time and shortens the distance between East and West. And as he mentioned, approximately 10% of the global shipping traffic passes through the South Canal, and approximately 95 to 100% of container vessel coming from South and Southeast Asia heading to South and East of uh, South and West of Europe and East Coast of the uh, United States coast is crossing through the South Canal. Um, I just want to stop at this number. We have approximately 1 billion ton of goods crossing the South Canal every year. For the last uh, years, we have only uh, 
coming to Egypt only the tariff or the Suez Canal vessel tariff taking from them these vessels. But now we have another thinking. We have to get a very big use of these goods in constructing industrial areas, logistic areas, ports, and to make add value to these goods to increase our hard currency entering to uh, Egypt from these goods crossing the Suez Canal. As my colleague also mentioned, what is the importance of Suez Canal? We are the longest canal in the world without locks. It's navigable day and night, uh, liable to be widened and deepened whenever required to cope with the expansion in the size of the world fleet ships. It shortens the distance between countries, which leads to reduction of the operation costs. The Suez Canal is being continuously developed. The draft and the water cross section has been increased to cope with the development of the shipbuilding in terms of size and tonnage. The depth of the canal allows the accommodate vessels of a draft up to 66 feet. The Suez Canal Authority uses the latest electronic system to track and monitor the uh, transiting vessels in the canal. We are using VTMS monitoring and surveillance cameras, also automatic identification system to ensure the safety of the vessels transiting the canal. In 2015, we opened the new canal for uh, transit, which um, was the waterway added to the original canal to allow ships to cross in both directions. The transit time of the vessel reduced from 22 hours to only 11 hours, and it, this was a big advantage to us to become the most and always become, inshallah, the most important waterway all over the world. Uh, I'll just, um, in the coming slide, show you what is the new canal. What mentioned in the blue color in, in the map behind me is the original canal, and what mentioned in the red color is the new canal. The middle part of the new canal is totally uh, digged in the desert with total length of 35 kilometers. We reach to 24 meters under water. And also we uh, widen and deepen the rest of the canal to reach to 24 meters to accommodate all kinds of vessels. To think about having a new canal size with this project with this size and this uh, cost, I'll talk to you about the challenge we were facing with the original canal. This film I'll show you is the, uh, our previous convoy system before having the new canal. Traffic system before opening new Suez Canal. This is the first south bound convoy, which starts transiting the canal at 12 a.m., heading to the anchorage waiting area at the Great Bitter Lakes. When the first south bound convoy reaches the anchorage area, it starts splitting into two groups. The first group is of vessels with a draft bigger than 45 feet, and they head directly to the eastern waiting area, which can accommodate up to eight mega vessels while the second group is of vessels with a smaller draft and those vessels head directly to the western waiting area. The first southbound convoy anchors in the Great Bitter Lakes area from 8 to 11 hours. And here we can see the northbound convoy coming from the Red Sea. This convoy starts entering the canal at 6 a.m. and it has an 11-hour direct transit from Port of Suez in the south to Port Said in the north. At that point, we can see the second southbound convoy waiting at Al Balah waiting area from 8 to 11 hours until the northbound convoy passes. The first and the second southbound convoys are not allowed to move from the waiting areas to the navigational canal until the last vessel from the northbound convoy crosses Al Balah waiting area heading to the Mediterranean. Actually, in this film, we have four major challenges to keep the vessels waiting in the canal for additional 11 hours, this extra cost for shipliner owner, 
and if we are not modifying our surf very fast and having the new canal, they will sink for, sink for alternative routes. The second challenge is the limitation of depths. We can accommodate before having the new canal only eight mega vessels with draft more than 45 feet. So we have to widen and deepen the canal very fast. The third challenge is the limitation of, depending on one canal, this can accommodate only 50 vessels per day. But because we look to the future, we see we, ha we will have by 2023, 100 vessels. If we didn't double the waterway in the, our canal, we will not accommodate this growth in the wallet trade and number of vessels. The fourth challenge is, depending on one canal, increase our challenge for security. If we have any problem with any vessels crossing the canal and stopping the canal, all the navigation will stop until we will take this vessel away from the uh, corridor of the canal and allow the vessels to move. The solution of all this challenge was a new canal. Traffic system. Sorry about this one. Traffic system before opening New Suez Canal. Traffic system after opening New Suez Canal, which starts transiting the canal at one day. Completely changed. Heading to the now we have two convoys only at the Great of three. Lakes. One. When the first southbound convoy reached the anchorage area, traffic system after opening New Suez. Sorry about this one, but you will see in this video. Uh, I try to make it work again. We doubling the waterway, so we have only two convoys. One come from south and one coming from north. And both of them is crossing at the same time. We eliminated the waiting time. Now we have only 11 hours to cross from the Mediterranean to Red Sea and opposite of this one. We save time, we save uh, safety because we have two canals. And also we increase our depth so we can accommodate all mega vessels, not this generation, but the next generation of vessels. And now we increase our capacity to have more than 100 vessels crossing the canal per day. Uh, fin finally, I want to Swiss just uh, mention to you uh, only three points about the impact of new Suez Canal on international shipping market. We increase the canal capacity to, ab to be able to accommodate 97 to 100 vessels by 2023, provide direct transit for 35, 45 vessels, increase the Suez Canal competitive advantage compared to the other alternative routes, the ability to accommodate the, no, uh, the new and coming generation of container ships to promote the Suez Canal as the first option to the international shipping lines, which reflect positively on the customer satisfaction, reduce the transit time to 11 hours compared to 18 hours, allow ships up to 66 six feet draft to bus on both directions instead of eight vessels northbound convoy in the past, increase the navigation safety. Perhaps some uh, problem happened with a big vessel called Katrina. It takes 10 days to solve this problem in the, in the original canal, but we keep the continuity in the new canal and Alhamdulillah, we didn't stop any vessel during this time. Finally, I uh, just want to talk to you about what is the SC zone. SC zone, it, a huge area on both sides of the canal covering approximately 461 square kilometer. This SC zone, we are working very hard now to uh, be, be make it ready for investment. We start the investment in this one. We have 160 uh, factories is working now, and we succeeded last year to attract more than 40 billion US dollar to uh, come and invest in South Canal. We have in uh, Suez Canal six ports, as mentioned on the front of you, three on the Mediterranean and three on the Red Sea, and we have four industrial area covering, as I mentioned, 460 square kilometers. I uh, am sorry for the limitation of time. I have a very short film about the SC zone, but I think the time will not allow, so I leave the film with the organizer if you like to have it. Thank you so much. I fully understand your agony that you, you know, crossing a Swiss canal is really a treat. I have crossed it as a navigator two times, and that was the old times when we had to wait, but that was a good wait because we could fish. 
but uh, as the technology is advancing in my uh, in the morning session we i said the super connectivity we have to work fast because time is money and for that the maritime sector also is advancing very fast and the cost of this advancement is very huge and only one country or one nation cannot bear it and that's where we have to have cooperative mechanism i think the, uh, egypt has done a great job that they have decided to make the new canal similarly pakistan also thought about it timely and we made the gawadar deep water port because if we don't make deep water port then we will not be able to do trade and we also made the karachi deep water port and this karachi deep water port and gawadar deep water port will continue to keep our country into business and we will continue to export at cheaper cost and import at cheaper cost i have uh, do you have any question or should we move to the next session any question sir ladies and gentlemen any question if you don't have a question i have a question so do you considering any of the ports on the swiss canal to become transit port yes. uh, please please uh, use the mic sir okay because this is a great advantage that egypt has we have uh, as i mentioned six ports in this area three on the mediterranean and three on the red sea the most important port for us is east bursaid we look at this one as a transshipment hub we are building now five kilometer of key walls and the new uh, key walls, it's under construction. It will be finished by the end of this year. We increase our capacity there and we increase the draft to 18.5 meter. So this one will be, inshallah, the jewel of uh, Mediterranean. Also in South, we have a gateway, it's called Sokhna Board. The uh, uh, advantage of this one, it's connected directly to the Egyptian market with 100 million persons. And with the agreement between Egypt and Africa, with Comessa, we have a very big open market in this area. I wish you good luck. And we are also trying to do a similar thing. So there is a uh, great opportunity of cooperation in developing of the transit port facilities and logistic facilities. And I think we should have a forum where we can discuss these maritime issues on a regular basis. With this, sir, I thank you all and we'll invite the new uh, speakers for the session two of Maritime. I'll now uh, invite Mr. Shoaib Ahmed Siddiqui, uh, Secretary, uh, Ministry of Communication from Pakistan. Mr. Jawad Rafiq Malik, Gawadar Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Naveed Jan Baloch, Mr. Tarek Hamdi, he is Chief Executive of the Elite States from Islamic Republic of Pakistan, and Mr. Nareeb Sawari Sawaris. He's not here. So we have only three speakers. Have I forgotten anybody's name who was supposed to speak here? Or any volunteers? Thank you. I invite uh, Mr. Shoaib, Secretary uh, Communication, to give his talk, please. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, is it working, sir? Okay, fine. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's an opportunity again for me to be with you for a very short time talking on the communication sector, which is all the more important for trade and connectivity, which is being 
planned and envisioned at this forum. As you say, communication or road development is the mother of development. Whenever you do some sort of communicative development, you bring in more opportunities for industrial growth and other, or other investments. So this session is has its own importance and from the connectivity point of view, this is uh, of paramount importance that we all plan to develop such mechanisms whereby our interaction is made regular and more convenient. The government of Pakistan strongly believes in increasing border trade and developing relationships with regional countries. This relationship between Pakistan and Egypt will further help to make the trade loop stronger. And we have been listening, observing as to what the, the measures are being taken and how these are going to benefit all of us. As there's little time, so I will simply mention a few things. Some important points. Pakistan recognizes that transport and interconnectivity is an important foundation for fostering economic belt and steps are being taken in this regard. Three major border crossing points at Torkham, Chaman and Vaga have been upgraded to facilitate the international transport. We remain committed to the ideals of regional integration and have engaged and continue engaging with our neighboring countries through bilateral and multilateral road transport agreements and maritime agreements. We are we firm believe that for effective and sustainable relationships, infrastructure and operational connectivity have equal roles. Pakistan is already a party to UN intergovernmental agreements on Asian Highways Network and on Trans-Asia Railway Network in addition to bilateral and multilateral road transport agreements with China, Iran, Turkey, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. We are also part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization on International Road Transport that will facilitate goods transport within the member states. So, this is the basic uh, importance of communication because if there is no communication, there can be no transportation of goods and uh, that is why initiatives are being taken and in, in difficult terrain, roads are being developed in various provinces of Pakistan to promote connectivity, to promote socio-economic well-being. And uh, with this, I would uh, mention that whatever we are talking about today in various sectors, we need to follow it up. We need to take it forward. That would be the real gain of this conference. And if we do not do it seriously, we would be missing on opportunities. So let us, let us carry on. And with your slip, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being brief, concise, and on the dot. Uh, now I invite uh, Mir Naveed Jan Baloch to come and discuss. Up. You don't have any slides. He doesn't have slides. Your Excellency, Minister for Planning, Husro Bakhtiar, Provincial Minister, Mir Zahur Ahmad Buledi, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a business 
person, so I try to speak only about business. But business, improving business is also related to connectivity. These civilizations have always developed along the waters. And the water have been used as trade routes since long. The modern, modern trade has further enhanced the need of trade through water. After the end of Cold War, in the early 1990s, Gwadir near the strategic state of Hormuz, aspired to be the gateway to the newly independent but landlocked and harbor carbon rich Central Asia states, as well as the resource rich Middle East. Through the CPEC and Gwadir port, China can easily access mineral rich Africa and the oil rich Middle East as well as export its manufactured goods to the Middle East, Africa and ultimately to Europe. The Chinese sea route from the Persian Gulf to the South China Sea, also challenged by the narrow Strait of Malacca, is approximately 13,000 km while the distance between Gwadir and Hanjrab is 2395 km. Gwadir offers the nearest marine, marine facility in western China, located 4,500 4, km from the east coast of China across the East and South China Seas. Gwadir provides the shortest sea access to all Central Asian republics the distance between Dushanbe and Gawadir is 2380 kilometers. Pakistan has already invited Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Afghanistan to join the CPEC. Pakistan has long planned to extend Karakoram Highway to Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan which will link these countries to the CPEC and Gawadir port, where Pakistan can easily, its, Pakistan can, can increase its annual trade from 45 million to $4 billion a year. For the landlocked republics of the Central Asia, the CPEC is the best viable and profitable route to the Indian Ocean. Gawadir, proximity to the Middle East and Africa serves as the main gateway to trade with these regions. For Pakistan, Gawadir is the gateway of Central Asia. But for China, it is the gateway to the Middle East and Africa since the CPEC, yes. CPEC would reduce the maritime route by the quarter the distance between the Gulf of Oman and East China Sea is more than 6,000 6, <laughs> nautical miles, with the Chinese report and the taking 25 to 30 days to, to reach their destination. The CPAC is a joint venture invest, investment in road, rail, energy, pipeline, and optical cable and crown part of the China ambitious Belt and Road Initiative to relaunch the formal Silk Road and to link it to the Middle East, Central Asia, Africa, and Europe. Currently, China is reportedly investing 200 billion US dollars in the Middle East and Africa, although Egypt is not an oil exporter but its bilateral trade with China was estimated 11.3 billion in 2016, ranking Egypt as China's third largest trade partner in the region. The Egyptian geopolitical location bridging the Asia and African continent make it to the gateway of Africa as well as Asia. According to the recent media reports, Egypt has already expressed its interest in joining the multi-billion dollar CPEC that would catch the dream of continental and civilization connectivity between the Far East and the Middle East. 
And at the end, I tell you something. I am a very good fan of Bill Gates. And there is a saying of Bill Gates, if you born as a poor, this is not your fault. But if you die as a poor, there is some fault between in you. So this is time to improve our economy. And I think CPEC is the best opportunity for Asia and Africa. Thank you. Now I'll invite uh, Mr. Tarek, and uh, he's going to be very interesting uh, because he's going to show us a clip which is uh, worth seeing. So over to Mr. Tarek. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good afternoon. My name is Tarek Hamdi. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of uh, 18. It's a new mixed-use residential project in Islamabad in Pakistan. Um, I'm not from the maritime sector, I'm not from the transport sector, but I'm far better than that. We are from the real estate sector, which makes quick money, offers opportunities, and actually gives you a new lifestyle. Um, the best thing about tonight is that I do represent the real thing. I represent 60% Egyptian investment in Pakistan via Oraskom in joint venture with the SAFE group, the SAFE holding and Kohistan builders and developers at 40%, which means that uh, this is all this summit is all about. It's about Egyptian, Pakistan trade and JVs. Um, we have acquired about 600 acres of land, 4,839 canals and 2.7 million square yards of land on which we have created a new mixed-use residential development called 18, named after the 18th district of Islamabad, 2,000 homes, 18 halls, golf course, business park, hospital, school, a new community, a destination and a nice mall and a five-star hotel. I'm not going to talk too much. I have a nice video to show you the project, and uh, I thank you all for your attention. Please have a look at this video. You probably will like it, and we want you on board. So I'm going to benefit from this to invite you to have a look at 18, and uh, if you don't have a home in Islamabad, that's the time to buy. Thank you. Low-rise apartments offer top-class accommodation. 
accommodation that sets new standards in luxury. Select a two to four bedroom apartment, fully configured for modern, flexible lifestyles, and with each one enjoying stunning views across the neighboring championship golf course. 18's professional 7,200 yard, 18 hole golf course and clubhouse sits at the heart of the whole complex, offering breathtaking panoramic views and the ultimate leisure facilities. The club is both the home of this championship golf course and the social and entertainment hub of the entire development. Its exceptional leisure facilities include a cricket pitch, squash and tennis courts, swimming pool, pro golf shop and a yoga studio, as well as gourmet dining, a rooftop terrace for enjoying sunset drinks and a cigar lounge. The resort at 18 is a five-star boutique hotel, built to the same exceptional high standards that all 18 residents enjoy. Limited to just 150 rooms, it provides the privacy and seamless personal service one expects from the world's finest hoteliers. With a spa, full gym facilities, extraordinary dining options and an event space capable of hosting and catering for 1,000 guests, the resort at 18 is unlike any other hotel in the Thalab. A dedicated entrance from the highway leads to the Square at 18, an exciting destination that offers the ultimate in retail therapy and entertainment options. You, your family, friends and other visitors can enjoy safe and unique shopping and dining experiences, ranging from exclusive fashion stores to everyday essentials retailers, full-service gourmet dining to relaxing cafes. The clinic is an exclusive state-of-the-art medical center which offers 18 residents both emergency and non-emergency medical facilities on site, plus inpatient and outpatient wards and a wide array of resident specialists. The core at 18 offers a new business hub for commercial tenants who can benefit from superb high-tech facilities housed in 13 unique buildings the design of this impressive business park reflects local culture and architecture while delivering the very latest in modern office amenities. Conveniently located close to both the new airport and downtown Islamabad, it's the perfect modern business space in Pakistan. Whether you're returning home for family or business purposes, at 18, the finest standards of luxury international living and a world of exceptional amenities awaits. Well, uh, that's us. I hope you liked it. What you see is what you get. This has all been developed from actual 3D models and Revit models. I forgot to tell you I'm Egyptian. I live in Islamabad. It's been about 15 months. I love it. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a good afternoon. So I have a question with Mr. Tarek. How many houses you are giving to the audience? Well, uh, how many they want? <laughs> yeah, on rebate. 30% off. Whoever comes to me today and tomorrow will have a big discount. He says whoever comes to me today or tomorrow will get 50% off. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there should be a lot of people. Yes, there are people. But you will have to bargain. He is a tough negotiator in trade. Not the He's not the salesman. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are coming to the conclusion. If you have got any questions on maritime, economics, logistics, you have the day. So, I'll not uh, tease you anymore. Uh, we'll uh, thank our speakers, but I'll leave with this one note that uh, maritime sector is very important and uh, jointly Egypt and Pakistan have to work on a serious level to develop this sector which is uh, which has many facets today we have only just discussed the transportation but it has fisheries it has aquaculture it has oil and gas it has tourism entertainment and a whole lot of things so in this short session we could not justify this topic but i hope uh, we might have another chance to discuss it i thank you all for patient hearing